Ahil. So thanks a lot for joining us today uh, in uh, the continued, uh, another fun-filled, extremely uh, interactive session for World Business Angel Investment Forum. Here we are today to bring you uh, some amazing panelists from all across the world, from different continents, uh, people joining from Romania, from, uh, from Johannesburg, from Bahrain. Uh, I am from India. Uh, we bring you a wonderful five women who will discuss on a topic uh, which will be very important in the current uh, climate and not only in the current climate as we go along, extremely important topic. So uh, welcome you all and thanks a lot for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Nikhil Agarwal. I work for an institution called IIT Kanpur, uh, which is based out of India. It's one of the leading institution, technology institution uh, in the country. I manage the incubation uh, and research uh, and commercialization activity for that institution. I am the CEO there. Uh, I have been associated with WBF uh, for almost four years. Uh, participate, uh, I participate in all the WBF activity, the best of my abilities. And uh, uh, again, I personally look forward learning from this great panel and this great panelist. Uh, to today's topic is about the engendering investment. Uh, and we want to discuss the gender dimension to the investment climate. Uh, regardless of the COVID situation, uh, that's a very critical topic. Uh, women normally get a lesser investment. There's a BCG study recently been done normally get lesser investment as compared to the male counterpart. And there are issues uh, even in the corporate boardroom, uh, the women are paid relatively less regardless of the uh, religion, caste, creed, or the geography. Across the world, that situation exists. And there are a number of studies, literature is available all across, which says so. Uh, it's an extremely critical issue. It become very vocal issue in this particular decade. And uh, there are a number of companies uh, some of the top ones which have started uh, creating a gender policy uh, without any bias, uh, which is a good news, but that's uh, too little and too less as we speak. So some of the po points that we will raise today will be related to the investment, but also we will uh, pitch upon uh, about the personal stories of these wonderful women who are joining me from all across the world, their experiences and how they have tackle this situation and how they want to do it as they uh, come out of the COVID situation, how the situation is in their own countries. Uh, with this, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Swati Mandela. Uh, Swati uh, is the chair of uh, our women committee. Uh, she has been a great leader in uh, leading this whole initiative and bringing the women and providing them and hope to everybody that uh, uh, there is a bright light coming in in the future. So uh, with this, I would like to welcome Swati uh, and invite her to give her opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nikal. Thank you for that great introduction and thank you for agreeing to moderate this. I also would like to thank all our speakers, uh, all our panelists for also agreeing to share their insights um, and the experience um, I think it's step we're in for really something really valuable and really insightful and really wonderful. I certainly look forward to hearing from every single one of them and from all different parts of the world. I think we're all in a very uh, difficult time, um, but I think the most important thing is for us to come together as women to encourage each other um, in participating in the global investment in entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, I look forward to our speakers sharing insights into ways in which we can increase the number of female investors that are in turn needed to support more female entrepreneurs to follow their examples. This topic today is key to the development of female leaders in the authentic socioeconomic transformation of women. COVID-19, this pandemic has devastated so many of our lives, but has also has also acted as a magnifying glass, amplifying, amplifying and exposing countless social issues. I know in my country, it's uh, really quite scary to see a lot of the things that have been brought to the surface that have been there for a very long time, but COVID-19 has really highlighted so many of the social ills, uh, gender-based violence being a really big one, 
um, and really just kind of um, putting a spotlight and so many of the gender inequalities that we still experience as women, I think, across the world. Um, it surely is a crisis that we are in um, and by all means uh, should, have, should be avoided. But I think uh, the path forward is really just kind of what we're looking to and how we come together and how we foster that and what that looks like. And uh, I think this is an opportunity for us to come together as women from all across the moon. Well, and not forgetting the men because the men also play a role. Um, I think uh, we are all in this together. And uh, I, I look forward to um, just understanding and sort of unpacking ways in which we can lead uh, and what leadership looks like in this new world. I certainly am interested to see uh, how women are leading uh, and what I can even learn myself from women leaders from all across the world, for examples in their own fields and in their own spaces. Um, I, 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 I do know that we are a committee that's really about um, fostering the empowerment of women, um, particularly in the entrepreneurship startup space. Um, but I think there's far more ways in which we can support each other, in which we do support each other as women. Um, sisterhood is something that I think has been such a valuable thing in this time of, of COVID um, in holding each other's hands and supporting each other. And so um, I'm not gonna take too much more of your time. I just um, encourage us to respond quickly in this rapidly changing world and that we develop initiatives that address critical issues facing women today and that we plan for those that are arising in the future because really, um, you know, we, we've got to lead and we've got to guide the next generation that's coming and they're looking to women like us um, for, for tools um, and advice and input and leadership uh, more importantly. Uh, I'd lastly like to thank uh, Bayboz um, for really supporting the women's agenda and really ensuring that he um, is really in the forefront of ensuring that the women's agenda is, 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 is paramount and, it's, and it has a space within the WBAF. And uh, I'd like to hand back to um, the High Commission of India, Professor Nikhal Agwal, and I thank you. Thank you very much, Swati. Certainly uh, a great start for the discussion. Uh, so today morning, I was uh, taking a walk in my uh, society and I saw up and I saw this, uh, the, the whole blue sky, uh, as you know that India is a very dusty climate and quite polluted in such a way. So, but we have not seen such uh, clean blue sky for quite a long time. So as Swati has said, it's a probably a reset button. So COVID situation has provided us an opportunity uh, for resetting everything. So forget about all the gender biases. I think all of us will be together when this is over. So thank, thanks a lot, Swati, for uh, saying so. Uh, moving forward, we have four wonderful speakers joining from Canada, Romania, Bahrain, and uh, USA. Andrea is from Canada. Hi, Andrea. You can Hello, yourself. everyone. So, and uh, Bianca from Romania. Hi, hello. We have Faryal from uh, Bahrain. Hello. And Shiraz from USA. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to start with uh, all of you. You can give a very short introduction about what you're doing, where are you from, uh, what kind of business you are engaged in. And uh, don't say anything about the topic. In the next round, we will discuss on the what we want to discuss in the topic. So over to Andrea, please. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, Swati, for uh, leading this discussion. Thank you, uh, Nikhil, as well, for moderating it. Uh, my name is Andrea Sesum. I'm a WBAF uh, Senator for Canada. I'm also CEO and founder of Ontario College of Business and Technology. And I am, in addition, an ambassador for uh, Women in Tech. It's a global movement that supports uh, women in technology. And um, uh, just a small note, I, um, I actually won an award for access, equity, and human rights. And I'm very passionate about uh, promoting um, access, uh, gender parity, and women issues. Uh, thank you very much, and congratulations for your award. Thank you. Uh, Bianca, over to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. 
Um, I will start to say that I'm happy today. Uh, it's such a great honor to be here with, uh, with you ladies. And uh, thank you, Bybars, for having a Women Leaders Committee. You know, uh, Bybars asked me, why did you join us? And I said, if a man who is uh, leading such a uh, strong organization has a Women Leaders Committee, this is such a powerful reason for me to be here. Uh, my name is Bianca Tudor. I am from Romania. Uh, I am an entrepreneur. Um, I am the founder of Elite Business Women, a company um, providing entrepreneurial education for women entrepreneurs. We have a business clubs uh, in Europe. Um, and also I am um, a senator for Romania for uh, World Business Angels Investment Forum. And uh, I'm involved in the project uh, Women in Business on the Danube region, nine countries across Europe. Um, and I love women entrepreneurship, and I think as well that education is the key, is the gateway to fulfill our destiny and to honor our lives. And it was something that it, uh, it made a difference in my life. I'm the first woman ever graduating a higher education in my family and the first one to have a business in my family and to go internationally with my business. So um, from the beginning, I would like to, to say that uh, I'm happy to do something in this, uh, in this field and to create this ecosystem together with you today. So thanks a lot, Bianca. We need people like you who are first in the family, but not the last. <laughs> I'm sure I will not be the last. <laughs> Marielle, over to you. Hello. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Mr. Babers, the chairman of WBF, for, uh, for creating this Global Woman uh, uh, committee and of course uh, a big thank for Mrs. Swati Mandela president of the global women leaders committee and for you our amazing moderator professor Nikki Lagarwal and I'm really honored to be among uh, this amazing uh, panel. Uh, my name is Faryal Nas I am a uh, high commissioner uh, for WBAF uh, in Bahrain and I am uh, the country director uh, for the newly uh, office in w, of WBAF that will be open soon in Bahrain. Uh, as you all heard that we have signed an agreement with uh, WBAF in the last uh, uh, Congress in Istanbul for opening an office uh, for the WBAF in Bahrain, a country office. Uh, I am also a the founder and and uh, the chairwoman of Bahrain Entrepreneurship Organization. And I am also a board member in the EO organization Bahrain chapter. Uh, I'm also uh, the vice chairwoman of uh, ASEAN Bahrain Council uh, in Bahrain. Uh, my, I am an entrepreneur and I am also uh, part of a family business that is uh, in, the, in the sector of construction. Uh, my, um, I am very much passionate about uh, encouraging uh, women entrepreneurs and startups and, and uh, help the ecosystem uh, in this field. And I'm very honored to be part of this uh, round table. Well, thanks a lot for making it today. Uh, then uh, over to Shiraz, please. Hello, Nirol. It's uh, Nicole. It's a great, great honor for me to be here. I'm very happy to finally see and meet you via online, uh, this online platform. I didn't have the opportunity to come to the World Congress in February in Istanbul due to the spread of the virus. I'm based in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia. I represent the speech improvement company, which is the oldest coaching company in the US. They're based in Boston, and we work with Fortune 100 companies. I um, represent them here in Southeast Asia, and we teach executive communication training to uh, C-level executives of multinational companies, but as well uh, in political areas and in other domains. Um, I am as well a mentor for various organizations over the last few years, such as the Cherry Blair Foundation. I received an award from Rotary International. So I've been active in many different countries in that sense, all over the globe, supporting and empowering women to come forward and find their voice and express themselves on a more international stage as well. Further, I have received a lot of international awards from different areas and angles. And um, it's always been my dream in that sense to create this platform that we are having now today, 
worldwide to be connected and, and drive uh, this kind of support net and opportunities forward for the next generation, for young girls, for women who want to be in business and do investment as well. As often they're not given the platform or the voice to express themselves in their own manner. As Jacinta Ardern said, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, she's not apologetic about not having been assertive enough, as they often say, not being aggressive enough, but she embodies a form of leadership which encompasses empathy and a heartfelt approach in terms of how she deals or has dealt with the situation in COVID-19 and many other female leaders. I think it's time to embrace both approaches. And I think we can create a network as we are having now. Thank you so much by Barzal Puntas for giving us all the opportunity and to have this voice worldwide. And the more we connect and discuss these kind of topics, I think the louder this voice is gonna be and the more important it, it is gonna be perceived as well. Because women are only more than 50% of the world population. And I really believe that it's time to be heard. Thanks a lot. Uh, wow, what a panel. You know, imagine that I have to moderate it. So I'm quite. <laughs> <laughs> so moving forward, uh, let's jump into our topic. I'm sure our participants must be waiting to hear some amazing views what you have to say. So today's topic is about how uh, we can increase the women participation in the global investment and entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. Certainly it's an extremely difficult and uncertain situation that we have today. Nobody in the world has imagined, uh, even the Hollywood movies have never imagined such kind of perfect crisis. So such, uh, such a terrible situation. Also there is a, people are saying, entrepreneurs who are saying that there is an opportunity. So how do you make sure uh, we can increase the women participation in the global investment climate, as well as the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, my request is that kindly limit your answers to two minutes so that we can do another round. Uh, I will start with Faria. Yes. Uh, well, I passionately, uh, I passionately believe that increasing the number of women who wants to make financial performance is of course a priority, but women say they are influenced by range of issues and in their investment decisions. They are looking beyond and the bottom line to use their money in a way that builds a better world. Women's distinctive approach to money and their preferences for investing responsibility studies makes to understand women's priorities when making investments. Decisions which, which we are all responsible investment. We need to find a, a new way of investing that doesn't compromise their values and ideas and a way that support progressive pioneering and sustainable business to build a better future. Women investors today uh, want more than good financial returns. The, that way to invest in a way that not only women becoming more economically significant, but have good percentage of the world's wealth and more concern about the social and environmental values and impact of their investments. I do have some percentages of investment uh, and their concern, which is like the poverty and income equity, which is 59% and 53% access to healthcare and 49% climate uh, change. I'd like also to add that women in technology, and uh, they are an untapped gold mine. Alison Rose, deputy CEO of NatWest, issued a report earlier this year that estimated the UK economy could see a 250 billion boost over the next 10 years if female entrepreneurship were to be embraced at the same rate as male entrepreneurship. Furthermore, Fortune 500 companies with at least three female directors have been their return of invested capital increased by at least 66%. Their return on sales increased by 42% and their return on equity increased by at least 53%. Uh, this is my introductory um, uh, remarks and I'd like to add uh, at a later stage how we can help women investors. 
Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, certainly what you have said is absolutely important. Uh, I will reflect back uh, once this round is over. Uh, can we go to Shiraz, please? Hello. Yes, thank you very much. Um, as I said um, before, I didn't want to take up too much space. I'm as well a Forbes strategic advisor. So I work internationally with women in different areas. I have been, Swati Mandela, very uh, honored to meet you here. I have been in South Africa, in the urban Johannesburg, Cape Town. I was in the Philippines. I've been living in Southeast Asia for the last 15 years and traveling the region, working with various kinds of organizations and people. And what I see here is that um, in terms of investment, it's still a, a very male dominated domain where women have equal rights to access, but it's very hard to actually get through to funding and financing and the support network that is so crucial to actually have entry points to these kind of investments. Um, many platforms that I have observed here are based on previous collaborations, on um, company interrelations in terms of people went to university together, they studied together, they're from the same organizations, they're from, from, from the same networks, etc. And it's still very, very rare to find women in leading positions at the top. Now, I must say I'm in Malaysia at the moment and my base is here. It, it is very atypical country because you have a lot of female leadership in this country here. You see a lot of women that are involved up to highest political honors and positions involved in everyday politics, in everyday uh, business decisions. There's a lot of female CEOs in Malaysia and they have not had this gender bias that much as I noticed, for example, in other countries like I'm originally from Switzerland in Europe or in Western countries where it's still very, very male dominated in that sense. So this is a very interesting observation for me to see as well what has been done differently and where does this difference come into play. Um, for me personally, I have done investment myself, not on a large, large scale, but as a personal investor. And I have noticed that in various fields that I was active, such as uh, real estate investment or personal investments as well, going to banks, negotiating deals, having to deal with lawyers and everything else. Bankers, the entire uh, system that is behind uh, investment has been often very challenging because I felt like um, a woman is still considered in certain areas not a 100% valid entity. So many times I had to bring in additional um, signatories or people to validate my statements or what I was saying or what I was doing just to give the signature of approval to things that should be done easily by an adult themselves, like opening bank accounts, opening different uh, platforms that are necessary for everyday functioning of, of, of doing investment and business. So where to start here for me is, is difficult. I have seen that there were changes over the last 30 years, definitely, and it has been a breath of fresh air to see that things are changing. It is kind of frustrating to see at the pace that this is happening. And during COVID-19, what I have noticed is it is a crisis of worldwide proportion. And whenever that happens, usually the mindsets are more open. They're more receptive receptible of new so-called new ideas and approaches. So I believe this is a window of opportunity for women to stand up and create a platform for their voices, as I said before. And this collaboration on an international level, I believe is unprecedented. 
yes, there were women organizations in every single country um, doing the work for themselves, by themselves in their respective environment. But now we have this opportunity, especially with the World Business Angel Investment Forum as well, to create this international collaboration and platform and communicate about the difficulties and shortcut and circumnavigate certain blockages and challenges that we have encountered over so, so many years of the decades. And I believe this is a great opportunity. It's a great accelerator for progress and for change. And we definitely should Thank use you. and implement that. Thank you. Thank more, you. Much more. <laughs> Uh, Bianca, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to start by saying that when we invest in women, they invest back 90% into their communities. So this is a, a good reason for which to think about engendering uh, investment. Um, also, I would like to uh, add some numbers. Um, just three out of 10 startups are uh, founded by women. Women receive 11% uh, from the funding by the venture capital funds. Uh, and also in the top 100 venture capital companies, uh, just 8% uh, are women partners in those companies. So um, we don't have that many women entrepreneurs. We don't have that many women business angels or women uh, investors. Um, and as well, um, I think that when it comes to taking risks, women don't have this native, uh, let's say, go-to uh, uh, approach. And um, uh, only, let's say that uh, in another study, 2% two, two of the companies founded by women are achieving um, a turnover of 1 million uh, in uh, Euro or uh, US dollars. So companies founded by women, they don't have that much of a, a turnover. Um, they are not that much uh, uh, into a risk when it comes to investing. They, they like to save money and to be careful in what they are placing their money in. Um, as well, I think that um, it's not an issue about women having the potential to grow a business or to scale up a business because we know that there are a lot of uh, women in business out there who are really thriving and setting an example. But I think it's more about um, having the balance between uh, personal life and, and her, uh, her business. I'm an entrepreneur and I have to say that sometimes I, I spend 10 hours, 11 hours, or maybe more in my business. Uh, there are a lot of uh, crises uh, in a business. Uh, you have to invest a lot of time. Uh, and sometimes as a woman, as we know, uh, we tend uh, our families, we tend our, uh, parents, grandparents, our children, you have to be there, you have to take care of your business, uh, you have to care, uh, take care of your, uh, of your team, so you have to be everywhere in the same time. And as well, you have to be uh, a lady, you have to take care of yourself, you have to be elegant, you have to uh, be uh, compassionate, you have to um, be there for everyone. So it's a, it's a little bit of, of, of a mix between uh, a social perspective, um, another perspective uh, regarding uh, the businesses funded by women uh, not having that much of a, a turnover. We know that uh, women make the business with their soul. They like to invest all their emotion and all their uh, heart in a, in a business. And the second priority for a woman is um, money, our money. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a mix between more than just one, one issue. And investing in women, it will uh, make our communities thrive. They will go back and uh, invest in their families, in the health system, in the education of their children, in uh, becoming volunteers. I'm a volunteer uh, in so many NGOs, so I give my uh, time as well uh, in, uh, in the volunteering area. Um, and this is what I, I would like to say at this, uh, this type uh, of the engendering investment. I think what you have said is absolutely right. Like uh, without the woman at home or managing the whole show at uh, keeping us together, uh, the world would have been uh, a different place in the last two months. Uh, the kind of roles that you have to play. Uh, and that's something which my question would be in the coming round. Uh, before that, I would, uh, we would like to uh, hear from Andrea. Thank you very much. So I want to go back to uh, something that Bianca mentioned. Uh, women reinvest 90% uh, back into community, which is 
uh, something that's very important, uh, job creation, uh, education, community uh, advancement, and approximately 252 million women around the world are entrepreneurs. So women currently represent the largest market opportunity and control 20 trillion in annual spending. And I'll give you a little bit of a background in terms of Canadian entrepreneurship system, because that's the country that I represent as a senator. Uh, so there was a study that was done, Canadian Venture Capital uh, found that 103 of 884 publicly announced investment deals went to companies with at least one woman founder or co-founder. And that amounts to only 11.7%. And this is in a developed country of Canada. Uh, and this is not even addressing underdeveloped or still developing countries. So nearly 90% of the investment deals uh, in the last five years uh, went to companies founded exclusively by men. And studies have shown repeatedly that uh, women startups uh, or women-led businesses perform 63% better than uh, men-led businesses. So some of the things to, I think, consider moving forward are a uh, stereotype of entrepreneurs. When you think of an entrepreneur, you usually think of a male figure, uh, you know, someone like Bill Gates. Um, and there's also issues of uh, gender norms. You know, uh, entrepreneurship is globally considered a masculine type of um, activity. Gender policy and programs uh, must address both gender ideology and limits that women face um, in access to uh, mobilization of key business resources. So uh, things to consider are, you know, do women have access to bank accounts? Um, and if they do have access uh, to bank account, who controls the bank account? So I think it starts at the root um, of how to get women to um, have access to resources, bank accounts, education, uh, education of, um, you know, bank uh, staff in terms of uh, women loans, uh, and it's it's a constant conversation that needs to be ongoing. And um, so I can get into more uh, deeper details in terms of how to encourage not only uh, women investors but investors in general to invest into women-led businesses or women-owned businesses. And I'll turn it over back to Nikhil. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think what you have said is absolutely right. It's about when people think about entrepreneur, they always think a male figure. That goes in the public policy as well. Uh, you would be surprised to know recently there was a study being published that in developing countries uh, and a public policy as a head of uh, the state or a community, there are more examples exist of women taking the lead than in developed country. So for example, uh, United States never had a woman president, but in countries like India or Bangladesh or even Pakistan or uh, in Sri Lanka, we have Croatia. a minister, woman prime minister or president. So uh, despite of the fact that that woman does not get their whole dues in developing countries, uh, Swati can certainly give examples from Africa uh, at the same time. But at the same time, like, you know, the when it comes to the representation of the people, the woman has done exceedingly well. So my question is related to the this particular comment, the next one. Uh, you all are you are all entrepreneurs, you have been investors, uh, you play a dual or triple role as a board member, entrepreneur, investor, maybe a homemaker, you know. As by Bianca has said, like, you know, as a lady or as a woman, a lot of hats do you do with. So my question is that have you witnessed the gender bias while doing the investment or receiving the investment? And how did you overcome it? So maybe you can share some insights from your own personal experience uh, that how did you overcome that particular uh, gender bias? What were the tricks of the trade that you have done? Uh, so that our panelists can hear your story and maybe get some insights from it. Kindly keep the answer short. Thank you. So I'll start with uh, Andrea. 
Thank you, Nikhil. I think drawing on from my personal experience um, as a woman who uh, is in an education business and uh, education business, uh, 10 years ago when I was uh, first starting, uh, was seen mostly, and uh, even today is uh, mostly male uh, dominant uh, sector. Uh, so when I first, did, uh, first uh, pitched my idea of starting a private career college, uh, to uh, a, a male uh, investor, um, I, uh, you know, I was mostly asked questions uh, that were uh, prevention questions. Uh, and a prevention question is uh, usually the one meant to focus on the negatives. Uh, you know, and I'll give you an example. So uh, promotion question, which is uh, studies have found that, uh, uh, you know, uh, investors will often use promotion questions when they're dealing with male founders versus female founders, uh, they will be asked prevention questions. So promotion question would be something like, can you tell us about yourself? Where for a woman, uh, they would be asked prevention questions, uh, how much of this are you doing in house? So I think the conversation needs to change uh, when uh, there is a pitch uh, to the investor, the question, it can be a male investor or a female investor, it needs to be a standardized set of questions uh, that are being asked for both uh, male founders and women founders of the business. And as an entrepreneur, the, if you do recognize, and you're a woman entrepreneur, if you do recognize a prevention question, the best suggestion is to then answer with a promotional answer. So if someone, if an investor asks you, you know, um, how much of a market share do you currently have and how do you plan on keeping that market share, you would answer with a promotional answer, which is the potential of the market share and this is what it is. And the studies found that, uh, you know, it, promotional uh, questions that were asked uh, I'm sorry, did we have a question? Or? Oh, please continue. I think there was some disturbance. Okay, uh, thank you. So the uh, it was found that it, uh, companies that were asked promotional questions and are most often male-led companies uh, raised more, actually 16.8 million versus a prevention asked questions of women founded businesses would raise an average of 2.3 million. So it basically costs 3.8 million per each preventional question you receive less. So the, my advice to um, entrepreneurs, both uh, uh, actually investors, both women and male is to have a standardized promotional question when dealing with uh, female and male entrepreneurs. You would ask the same questions of both. And that's a great tip. In fact, that not only for women, it is very beneficial for all the entrepreneurs. Okay, Bianca, what's your personal experiences? Well, I, I always say that uh, business doesn't have a gender. We have the same challenges, uh, even though we are a woman in business or a man in business. Uh, for example, in our events, both men and women can attend. Uh, sometimes men are, are speakers or mentors. My two mentors who have impacted my life are, are men, so I really appreciate their uh, knowledge, experience, and drive uh, in, in growing businesses. But when we are talking about uh, investors and uh, investors uh, investing in women, I think that um, it is... Um, an approach about uh, how they study uh, the pitches of women. Um, investors look at the, the attitude, the mindset, the go-getter attitude, the, the drive, the team. And when a woman is in a pitch, and last year I was uh, a jury member in two uh, international competitions, uh, one in uh, Budapest and one in Bucharest, um, women, when, when they come in front and they present their businesses, uh, their attitude is not 
uh, as we see in, in, the, in, in men, like go-getters, like they're really confident. Sometimes they are really scared about public speaking. They don't like to be in the front. They don't like to be in the spotlight. And investors do uh, like this type of an attitude in business. When you have a business, you have to go there. You have to, uh, to uh, do networking. You have to speak. You have to present your business. You have to have public speaking um, uh, qualities. Um, and I think sometimes women, even though they, they are preparing a lot, they are pitching, uh, they lose in, in this, let's say, soft skills uh, uh, area. And another uh, key point is that, uh, at least in my experience uh, in Europe, investors are uh, in, during these times, they are looking for uh, businesses in, in IT, in um, um, IE, in uh, um, uh, technology mostly and women they they are mostly in in services in education um in fashion so uh, it's a little bit of the request in the market and uh, women having businesses not in uh, the domains in which investors are looking because at the end of the day if you are an investor you really want to have a profit you want to make your money grow and multiply so um, we should also look at the domains in which women are, are doing businesses and maybe to, um, uh, to see some policies for investors investing in education, in uh, uh, services, in this type of businesses uh, funded by women. Thank you. I think I agree what you have said, like uh, business, sometime, like not with everybody, the business is a business, entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. Number of investors I know that they don't even like, they do the blind investment. They don't even look at the founders till that time they have read the whole script about the feasibility of the business. And then they look at the team. I think they are the uh, people with uh, uh, straightforward mindset. They are not looking for any gender bias, but they want to look at the merit of the business. Uh, certainly, uh, very, uh, some uh, very important points raised by you. Uh, Freya, would you like to share your experience in from Bahrain? Yes, Professor Nikhil. Uh, well, uh, to be frank, angel investing in Bahrain is something relatively new in Bahrain. So, and we have only maybe one uh, entity who is uh, doing that. That's the main reason why we uh, signed with the WPAF to open a country office for angel investing in Bahrain. So, but from my point of view and from what I have uh, went through in different courses with the WBAF, uh, well, uh, I think I will take it the other way around. I mean, in this, in this, first of all, I want to mention that in this situation uh, during the COVID-19, we need to, all women has to put their uh, hands together and to support each other. This is number one. Number two, uh, if we think about uh, angel investors, I think the investors themselves should be qualified investors. It is also, this is a very import, important too, because they should have also, uh, uh, angel investors are not only uh, pitching money. It is also about mentorship. It is also about networking. The mindset is very important. They have to know the company value. And of course, they should do the due diligence, background profile, mentorship skills, play, and very important role is the, the team itself. And I think that uh, from my point of view, if we want to support women to support other women or invest in other women and to, to reduce the gender, we need to give them a practical guidance. I think practical guidance and framework to support women in understanding what to look for and how to access the sustainability performance of companies and sectors they want to invest in. Plus, uh, we, we have to think about product availability. We need more financial products and services to cater for the many women who wants to invest responsibly. For example, offering uh, thematic uh, investment funds focused on uh, themes such as climate change, environmental protection, sustainable infrastructure and health and well-being. These products should be made more transparent, visible and accessible in the market. Uh, one more thing is the information and analysis. We can also empower women as investors by providing better information on the analysis of the various responsible and impact investment products currently. 
and sharing information and the sustainability performance and metrics of the products they offer. Plus, we have also uh, an element which is the networking. We need also peer-to-peer -peer learning, experience sharing opportunities and networking to help women grow more confident in their financial decision making. And uh, last and not, uh, and la not least is we need to keep the dialogue. We need to keep the, uh, the conversation going on, how female investors can reshape, how we can use the capital for gender good. So these are all elements that we should, we should help the investor to make the decision in investing in women by maybe highlighting these kind of informations, whether they are men or women. But if we talk about increasing the investment of women in women, in women and uh, entrep entrepreneurs, I would uh, recommend these points to be covered so we can be more transparent and more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very relevant points. So before I uh, go to Shreya, uh, I want to make two quick announcements. One, uh, both the, of them are for uh, the attendees. Uh, after this particular round is over, we will go one more quick round of questions. And meanwhile, you can prepare your questions for any panelist uh, and you can post it on the chat. Uh, we would like to read it and these chats are uh, read by everybody so you can uh, ask questions you can make a comment on any of the uh, 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 questions I can't hear him. Okay, here, I think Nikhil's connection just interrupted. So, if no. anyone... oh, yes. 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 Are we are we back? Yes, uh, yeah, everybody is back. So don't worry, you're not disconnected. Only I was disconnected. Okay. <laughs> you know, so we should be thankful to whoever invented the internet that is still working, and everybody is able to. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that internet does not work for a day, the world will go more crazy. The more people will die just because of depression of not having internet, not able to check the Facebook and WhatsApp. So what I was saying is that on the behalf of the World uh, Global Startup Committee, there is a survey that we are conducting uh, to understand uh, the situation, the current situation with the startup. There are already hundreds of startups uh, from hundreds of countries. All the five continents have already participated. Some of you have not participated, please click this link. It will just take five minutes to uh, uh, fill up the survey. It will be very, very useful for us to understand at WBA what is going on. And some of these questions will be answered when the webinars for the startup committee will start from next month onwards. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, sorry, Shreyas, over to you now. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. yes, sorry, there was a little technical glitch. I didn't know on which side it is my connection isn't that stable either. So it, it's a back. Um, coming back to uh, the US market, we think on here a lot of uh, female founded fintech startup companies that are popping up out of the woodwork so the last one or two years. But let's not forget that the overall percentage of funding for female funded uh, startup companies, even if it's in, in, in Silicon Valley or in, in uh, uh, tech companies, is only 2.2%. So 2.2% out of 100, that leaves the majority of the cake to other uh, male 
in that sense, founded companies. And the trend has been going on over the last 17 years to slightly see an increment and more awareness in terms of funding accessibility. But that increase has been since 2005 only by 7% over the extended period of time of 15 years, actually since 2005 to 2017, the percentage here that has been mentioned is rising from just 7% in 2005, sorry, I made a mistake, to 21% in 2017. So that's the latest data that I had available here in form of a statistic. As well, women-founded startups have similar rates of follow-on financing in terms of um, financing for same figures for non-women-founded companies were 52%. So it's higher on a general, uh, in a general rule, but the trend and the awareness of what is going on and how these enterprises can be supported is rising. And that's a very good thing, I believe. Um, as I said before, it's very, very slow, but I believe that this COVID-19 crisis is a tremendous opportunity and accelerator, as already said, because uh, women are multitaskers. They are able to handle different types of approaches at the same time. Usually we have to be much more flexible in our daily approach in how we work, how we live, how we deal with situations. I'm not saying we're better, we simply have more practice in juggling so many different balls in the air. And I, I think that now in this kind of environment, it provides a platform where these skills are really, really needed. So before we came out of this very strict hierarchy of multinational, for example, companies or investment structures, where it has been uh, built up over decades in terms of credibility, in terms of credentials, in terms of background, um, how much weight you were carrying as a person, as a founder, as a company in that sense to ask for these types of funding. Nowadays, it's an unknown situation. It, it, it's it's uh, uncertain what is going to happen over the next few years. There's a major shift in perception of work, how we work and how we function, how life has to be reorganized under these circumstances. And in that sense, as women, I believe we are predestined to act on this kind of uncertainty because we just had so much practice in dealing with this on a daily basis. I don't want to be sexist, understand me right? My majority clients, uh, the number is about eight, 98%, yeah, it's men. I work with male CEOs, CFOs, with um, mm, political leaders, they are all men. So when I get the opportunity to actually, you, sorry, my mic, um, when we have the opportunity to support women and to back up women and to give them the knowledge in how to move one step ahead in their ambitions and their plans, instead of saying, um, oh, it's very hard, it's very difficult. No, no, no. Uh, this is how you can do it. This is what has worked before. Uh, let me connect you to a female leader who has done it, who has done and walked the way and has, has actually the experience and the knowledge, the background to support you with very, very specific how-to approaches. Not just saying what needs to be done, but how do you do it? How do you structure it? How do you communicate it? And then how do you present it? So one big topic that we have been working with is um, training and coaching as well female startup founders in how to present to stakeholders and shareholders, in how to present to investors and in a way that they get hurt. So I believe that from a female point of view, we cannot just copy paste the male approach because it's not the way we normally function and get hurt. So how do you then do that? How do you approach it in a manner that the message gets across, the numbers are taken seriously, and the people are taken seriously, seriously behind the presentation and the approach. So I believe women reaching out to women and collaborating worldwide in different cultures and 
setups and different kind of networks again as many networks as possible collaborating is really important and in that sense the global women economic leader uh, the global women leadership committee from world business angel investment forum has a lot of ground to cover in the months to come in how do we reach out to other organizations how do we collaborate with other platforms how do we connect to other international female leaders and make this their platform as well. Thank you. <clears throat> so one thing I must say to all of you that you are uh, astrologers because you can, I have not told you any questions. So uh, just to hear to all the attendees, many of the uh, panelists were asking me to give me the questions that what I will ask. I said, no, I will ask the, uh, some of the questions, impromptu questions. <laughs> But the question which I am about to ask, you are already giving answers. So that's not, <laughs> that's not. That. You've been torturing us a lot. <laughs> yeah. so we made our uh, homework. Yeah. So uh, my next question is about not only in terms of raising finances, the women entrepreneurs also uh, face a lot of challenges uh, in raising teams. Uh, number of uh, the students, graduates, other people, when they see that the woman is in charge, uh, particularly an entrepreneur, uh, they don't want to uh, put head in the ring. And that has been witnessed across the world, regardless of the geographies. So how do you uh, form the human, cap human capital? And I would call it a, a female human capital formation. And what I think the uh, Shreyas has already said regarding the women to woman networks. Uh, so how do you do that? Uh, and does it beneficial if you have any experience of being doing this in your country? The second question is also related to it. Uh, and one of the, uh, the questions are already pouring in. Uh, so another, qu another question is coming in from the chat is about uh, the institutional support provided by the government uh, in forming the teams or in raising the funds. Uh, is there any examples exist from your geography? Uh, I will start with Freya. Can you please, uh, Mr. Nikki, uh, repeat the first question, please? Sorry. Yeah, the first question the first was question. regarding that. Yeah, regarding the challenges women face to build up their team uh, while uh, building up the company. And what we have seen is that many women are not able to get the dream team, what is called, uh, as compared to the male entrepreneur. Uh, so do you have any method which we call the female human capital formation uh, that how the women uh, coming together uh, create and help each other uh, and uh, create those networks or an appear to be a network basis if you have any experience to share that? Yeah, well, from my point of view with this regard is like from with with the organization i am running which is bahrain entrepreneurship organization we do support any startup and of course we have an incubator to to support anyone with an idea to 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 capitalize uh, their their uh, their ideas and and to form their companies we do have a stream of workshops and we also support them uh, in a way in accessing and finance accessing as well. So uh, we also have, I mean, when we talk about Bahrain, for example, Bahrain, we have uh, the total CR owned by women is 56% uh, in Bahrain. And there are so many uh, initiatives that has been launched by the government to support uh, women entrepreneurs, which is one of them, which is the uh, Entrep Women Entrepreneur Fund that was launched uh, by Her Royal Highness uh, a few years back, which was uh, almost uh, 5 million dinars, which is, which is focused only for women entrepreneurs. Uh, plus, we do have uh, Temkin, which is which is also uh, entrepreneurship uh, support uh, fund in Bahrain, who is also uh, which which is also providing uh, consultation and different programs and uh, fund uh, with support and with regards to different. Uh, 
programs and type of businesses that they can come up uh, with. Uh, we also have- It's eight o'clock. Yeah, we, we, we of course, uh, we also have the liquidity, uh, fi uh, liquidity uh, initiative, financial liquidity initiative fund that has been also uh, launched in Bahrain by the Crown Prince to support also uh, entrepreneurs and SMEs in Bahrain. So these are all different tools that our government is uh, uh, providing uh, to support uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem in Bahrain. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Bianca? Um, okay, if I understood correctly, uh, I think the first question was also about what type of challenges a woman faces when she has to build up a team. Is this correct? Okay. Yes. yes. Um, well, I have to say that uh, one of the, the challenges uh, a startup has is to build up a team. Because when you're at the beginning, you tend to be a solopreneur, as we say. You, you tend to do everything yourself because you, 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 you think that you have the, the knowledge and you know how to do it better. So I think uh, uh, not only in uh, businesses funded by women, but also in, uh, in uh, businesses funded by, by men, it is a challenge to, as a startup, to think about um, building a team around you. You cannot grow your business if you, if you don't have a team. Uh, you cannot do it everything by yourself. And I believe that um, having the, the specialist in your team will save and will uh, grow your, your business uh, in, a, in a faster way. So yeah, I am for the teamwork. As a woman, I think it depends. Uh, women leadership is more inclusive. Uh, they tend to, to work and to, uh, to work with, with, with the teams. But um, depending on the team, if it's mostly men or mostly women, Sometimes uh, a woman has a challenge to lead a, a men's team, if maybe it's in IT, let's say. Uh, and here you have to have a mix between the authority you need to have when it's about business and risk and uh, putting your signature there if you have to, um, to have a decision, but also it's about nurturing the team members in order for them to find the confidence to take decision by themselves, to grow the business, to have the confidence, and, and to transfer the know-how between the team members. Um, so it's a mix of leadership, both when we need the masculine leadership and the, the feminine uh, way of leading. Uh, and these are the challenges of a woman. How do we know when we have to be more, let's say, uh, have more authority? And sometimes if a woman has authority, uh, we say that she is bossy. We don't like women with an attitude. Uh, and then we think, but why? <laughs> you said you want to have authority and now you say, but you are being bossy, you, why are you doing that? So it depends, uh, it's a little bit tricky, but um, yes, I think in a business you have to have authority, you have to lead uh, with integrity and with responsibility, but as, as well, you have to nurture your team members, you have to pay attention to their needs and to, uh, to help them to become leaders as well. Um, I don't think in the um, in a team in which we have uh, a boss and uh, his uh, or her her employees, we we need a team in which um, we are uh, all there because we are inspired to be there and we want to to grow together. I think growth is a value uh, in my life and for for people as well. Uh, in terms of the um, what type of the support, uh, what type of support the government provides in Romania? I have to say that we have a women association. Um, we have some grants for women uh, in business. Uh, we have um, some mentoring programs by the government. So uh, they are um, open to, to support more women uh, in business. Uh, and this is a, a good news. Uh, and in Romania, actually, the number of women entrepreneurs is raising. Now 40% are, are women. So I, I, I think that in the, in the future, we will be 50-50 and this is good for, for us. Uh, and for me as, as a leader of the Elite Business Club for Women Entrepreneurs. Uh, so we have measures, but I think that it's more of an education approach. We need more um, practical uh, type of approach. We need um, know-how exchange. We need mentorship programs. 
uh, we need good role models, examples, and this know-how exchange. We need to promote more women in business who are really uh, doing the efforts to, to grow. If you, if you go to the top 100 Forbes, you will see only men there. And this is not a good way if I am a woman at the beginning and I will see the Forbes magazine, I will say, oh no, there are no women there. So maybe it's hard, maybe it's not possible. So I think it's also a change of the mentality of how the media works. We need to promote more women and the leadership that a woman has when she's uh, leading a company. So um, more of, of uh, the mentality and also the programs, this is a, a mix between how we can work it together. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fias? So when you look at the US, what has been happening over the last two or three years, it's very encouraging because there have been more and more companies popping up, specifically founding women startup companies and female entrepreneurship. And it has been segregated as well into different groups of, of the population like Latinos or black women or uh, all these uh, topics that are very, very um, in the US specifically, we wouldn't necessarily make that kind of distinction in other countries, but um, they have had this growth of incubators that were specifically designed for women. And actually, if uh, you look at the platforms that are available, there's more and more support, mentorship, and uh, knowledge-based training as well available than just three or four years ago. So it's definitely growing. And I believe um, it's the beginning of a new time in that sense. And it's encouraging. I just do hope that it won't drop off again once things, which I don't think they will, go back to normal in that sense. That we keep that momentum going and that we, as we said before, female entrepreneurs support female entrepreneurship. There's many ways to do that. Uh, with networks, if you have an extended network to give access to the kind of network with mentorship to share the knowledge, um, with coaching in terms of, as I said before, if you already walked the path, showing other women where to tread on the same proven methods to success, and as well how in general, in a way, this whole female male. Uh, communication to me is, is a bit outdated nowadays because we're all in the same boat. We all sit in the same circumstances. We all deal with the same emotions, with the same difficulties, with the same challenges that we have to solve over the next one, two, three years. And it's an unnecessary hurdle to impose then this is solely women and this is solely men. No, not let's not do that because then we do just the sa exact same thing that has happened before. The whole accessibility to economy has been only male dominated for a very long time. If we now just go to the other extreme and go for female only, I think that's not the way to go forward too. In my personal opinion, I believe a collaboration is necessary from human to human in general and from someone who has influence to people who do not have this kind of platforms and accessibility from someone who has knowledge and education to reach out to people who have not had the opportunity to get to that kind of level and network and interconnectedness as well. I mean, we all assume nowadays everybody has internet, which is not the case in many areas of the world. Um, there's different way to approach these, these kind of topics. And I believe we should just keep in mind uh, humans interacting with humans. The real thing I think we should look at right now is the antidote to panic, right? Because so many businesses, they start to panic. They have to close down. The shops are closed for the last two months. They cannot earn any income and often they go out of business. What are they going to do next? Regardless of their men or women, right? Regardless of their uh, pre-existing functioning and networks, 
this is an unprecedented situation. How do they move forward? And I believe if someone has the knowledge and the experience and the background to give these people a structured approach in how to address the issues and the problem solving skills. As you said, um, Swati Mandela before um, the history of your country, sorry, um, it, it, it has been um, challenging to say the least over many decades. And people who have this kind of experience then reaching out and it might sound, sound uh, unusual, but reaching out to countries and economies who did not have that kind of background experience in how to handle it in a positive manner is, is crucial because then otherwise voices take over that uh, go in for the kill, I call that because they're in a better position, they are better uh, placed to to watch of the more experience, knowledge, exposure, and influence. And this is something that every country can contribute to, and especially people in the World uh, Business Angel Investment Forum have the capacity to do this on many different levels. And um, I just wanna call out to don't just look at gender from the female perspective as well. So if you do have the opportunity to give grants to companies or coming up entrepreneurs, um, don't go to the other extreme and only look for women in that sense, because I believe only collaboration brings us forward at this point in time on every level, be it financial, be it political, be it economical, be it social, uh, cultural. We have one planet, we have one humankind, and at the moment it looks pretty uh, stressing for many, many people. And to bring down that level of stress, and again, the antidote to panic, how can we structure the approach, the knowledge, how can we bring it to people? I think that's a big responsibility to carry for anybody, man or woman, in that sense. Thank you. I absolutely agree with you what you have said regarding uh, the advice to the uh, investors that don't, don't look at, uh, we are all in together, don't look at the uh, male founder or a female founder. Like if I'm the investor, mm -hmm. uh, on, I do invest in companies. What I look at is that the company should be able to solve a problem the company should, should be able to make money. Yes. These are the only two things which I look at. Then the third thing comes, whether the founder can do it or he can do it alone or he will bring in five people with him. Will he is working with the family or with the brothers or sisters. It does not matter. Because once the two questions, the first two questions are answered, then the company is worth investing into. Uh, over to Andrea. Yes, because number and figures don't lie, right? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, please, Andrea. Thank you. So how does an, a woman-led business attract more talent? And I think I'll address this question more from a personal experience versus a study. Um, I think it's important for women-led, women-owned businesses in order to attract talent and not just any kind of talent, but the right talent for their company is to plug into the right network. And the right network can be, uh, for me, it was plugging into uh, different associations um, where I could really draw on the uh, pool of the talent those associations have. Uh, so one of them I mentioned before was Women in Tech, uh, the, the global association. Uh, there's also local associations that you can plug in um, either as a mentor or a speaker or a panelist, uh, volunteer. And it's all about working together as a community. Um, as, a, as an owner of a woman-led business, uh, one thing that you can do in order to uh, show the uh, showcase your company and showcase yourself as an authority. So if you are in an education business or if you are in a technology business is to use the power of social media. 
uh, nowadays it's 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 really uh, about reaching the talent and I think a lot of uh, um, recruitment companies are having issues reaching the right talent as well so you as the as the leader um, use the power of social media talk about your company put a face to your brand brand yourself as a compassionate leader as a knowledgeable leader as someone who has the authority to speak on the matters in that particular uh, sector or the industry you're in, and that in turn will attract the the right kind of talent that you want uh, to employ in your company um, um, and and have them uh, have them as part of your team. And in terms of uh, Canada and what Canada is doing uh, to uh, support women-led, women-owned businesses is they actually have the initiative, and their initiative is to double the number of women-owned businesses by 2025. And this is led by Honorable Minister uh, Nick. Uh, she's the Minister of Small uh, Businesses and Export Promotion. And they have actually uh, committed to investing $2 billion uh, in order to double the number of women-led businesses by 2025. So they, they are giving uh, women-led businesses up to $100,000 in federal uh, funding to help them grow and reach new markets. And that includes exporting uh, products as well. Great, uh, I think there are more questions coming in uh, regarding some, so some of the issues we have already addressed as a part of uh, our discussion. So I would invite the panelists to look at the questions as they come along, uh, we will try to address. Uh, we have around 14 minutes left. So one of the, uh, before we close, what the last question which I want to ask you today, let's say the pandemic goes away tomorrow morning, just like that. It has come just like that, it goes away just like that. And you're all free to go outside. As an entrepreneur, what are the top two things which you will do in the next one week? And this question is also to Swati. Swati, I'll start with you. So, sorry, Nicole, just repeat the question, please. Uh, I said that, let's say that uh, this whole COVID situation goes away tomorrow morning. So what the top two things you will do in the next one week time as a woman entrepreneur? Um, well, I mean, I think the first thing that I would do is certainly just um, take the learnings that I've had from this period um, and understand that um, the world is not the same and will not be the same going forward. And I think what I've certainly come out of this with is also just to um, become more of a mentor and to also just ensure that I take on more women um, that I can impart and that I can share with and that I can build up. Um, I think what I've heard tonight from all the panelists is that um, we need to support each other more. We need to be there for each other more. And I think women entrepreneurs certainly need to be um, guided more and be led more. So for me, I think I would certainly be trying to um, assist um, and invest and help more female led businesses and startups um, because we're facing a job crisis in my country. Um, we have one of the highest levels of unemployment uh, and that was even before COVID and now post COVID, it's gonna be even higher. So I think there'll certainly be more of a need for um, the support of um, women in entrepreneurship. But I think, I think we are all correct in the sense of it's not just men, it's not just women, it's men as well. It has to be more of a collaborative effort. So I think my efforts will certainly be more towards um, trying to see how I can support uh, better than I had been before, uh, more female-led um, entrepreneurs. Thank you. I absolutely agree with you. The, the job situation uh, will be very challenging as we uh, go forward. Uh, Bianca, what you will do, the top two things. Well, when the pandemic started, I, I had the team building with my team to make sure we are everyone okay, we have a structure, we have a plan. Uh, so uh, when it will end, I will start also with my team. Uh, it is very important for me. Also, I think um, online is really a, a good channel to grow, to inspire, to share uh, know-how and expertise in business, to reach out to more women entrepreneurs and not only. So I will invest more in the online uh, channel. 
Uh, and uh, I think that as well, I will be, I will pay more uh, attention to global collaboration. Uh, we were speaking about globalization and sometimes we don't realize that it's really here. We can just um, click and uh, uh, be in contact with, uh, with people. So um, I think more unity between uh, not only women organizations, but also uh, business organizations um, uh, in general. Uh, it will be um, it will add a good value to the economic and environment and not only we can build projects together uh, at the same table having the resources i have with the resources other organizations have in the same place we have will have a greater impact so it will be good if we understand that unity is not uh, just a fancy word to say it is uh, the key because we are struggling in in a lot of ways uh, climate change and uh, uh, health uh, and uh, uh, everything, the technology. So I think that it will be good if we will just um, stay a little bit and um, think about how we can collaborate more, how we can help more, how we can uh, work as a team at a global level. So absolutely. Uh, I think I like what you have said and I will note it down in my diary. Uh, after the COVID, I will do two dinners. I was thinking of doing one with a family, but I think the team dinner is also extremely important. We have to get back as a team. Uh, we have to talk to each other. Uh, everybody has gone to a terrible situation, uh, not only uh, outside, but inside, you know, sitting at home, working uh, on Zoom and without meeting people is extremely challenging, stressful. So I think as a team, we have to come together if we have to succeed. I really like that suggestion. Thank you. Andrea, what's your suggestions? So first thing that I would do, uh, Nikhil, is go out in a nice uh, uh, coffee, local coffee shop and have a nice cappuccino mm -hmm. in person. Uh, but other than that, I think I would like to uh, connect with my team physically because, um, you know, we are humans and we, even though we have technology available and, you know, the Zoom and uh, we're able to see and connect with people like that, I think we, uh, we miss sorely that human connection. Um, and I would connect with my team, but I would also want to take time then and connect with all the wonderful people that I, if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh, as much as, it's sad to say I probably wouldn't have connected as with many people that I have during the pandemic because it really forces us is forced us to uh, look at communication um, and think out of outside of the box uh, on on how to uh, continue to network and uh, grow our network uh, so I can say because of pandemic I, I was sort of forced to uh, step out of my comfort zone because for me it's all about the handshake and meeting people in person um, versus you know having to meet them on zoom um, so that's that's one of the things I, I would do is try to connect with all the wonderful connections from zoom and meet them in person uh, finally uh, you know we have a lot of Turkish friends here who are listening to our conversation the cappuccino in Starbucks is not a coffee, it's a waste of time. That's what they would say. <laughs> Turkish coffee. I'm going to correct myself. Strong <laughs> Turkish coffee. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> uh, she has what you will do for the first, once you come out of the situation. Can you hear us, she has? Oh, sorry. Yes. Hi. My connection is a bit lagging. It's not stable. I apologize for that. Um, the first thing we'll do is what I have been doing over the last eight weeks, which is um, reaching out to people, uh, continuing to work. I have the big privilege to be able to work online internationally and to continue doing that. I think it would be great if you could continue doing what we're doing now because to me personally i feel people have been much more communicating than they used to before and with communicating i mean uh, they have been much more present 
it hasn't been swallowed by every day's noise and stressful lifestyle with unnecessary commuting and a lot of unnecessarily eaten up time traffic jams and tiring other events. We really could all focus fully on what is it that we want to achieve and what we want to do. I found it to be a very positive uh, experience in that sense because I believe a lot of contacts, connections and organizations as well that I have been able to reach out to over the last two months wouldn't have happened otherwise without this lockdown. People were too busy, they were too caught up in their everyday life stresses and they were simply not present in many times and it really provided that pause button to reassess what is important, what is truly meaningful and to keep looking for that. Uh, there was a statistic that they did in the US regarding working from home. And it showed that over 60% of the world, um, not the world, sorry, over 60% of the population, I apologize for these interruptions. It's 1.30 at night here at the moment. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm trying to keep it together. <laughs> so over 60% uh, of the population actually don't want to go back to their cubicles or their office work or to ever what else they were doing before. They want to continue and work from home. I, I'm aware not everybody can do it. It's not appropriate for every kind and type of business interaction. But I really do feel that it's, there's a big, big shift happening. And Google and, and Facebook just announced that until the end of this year, regardless of COVID-19 outcomes or not, they will continue with this work model because it cuts overheads, it, costs, it cuts unnecessary costs, it makes uh, the workforce more flexible and I believe as well more focused, although all the distractions at home with children and raising families etc has been a huge challenge, um, the motivation is much higher. People really want to do things and change things and move forward and create this new kind of economy. So this shift has been impending for the last, I would say, 10 years. Before it was a fancy lifestyle if you were working from anywhere in the world on your laptop and you could travel independently and just do your work from anywhere where you were at. But now it has become the majority is doing this. And I believe this will create a permanent shift as businesses realize we can operate on a much more economical level with often higher outputs in the end because people are more focused when they work in what they're doing and it doesn't get consumed by so much unnecessary stuff like excuse me uh, office politics and, and 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 everyday life tasks that just fall away with the setup of the situation Human interaction is very relevant and important physical interaction, but I really believe people have communicated and interacted more. They have uh, FaceTime calls and Zoom calls and all these platforms, WhatsApp and whatever is available to reconnect with friends, with business partners, with, with new people on LinkedIn. We had a lot of time now to actually focus on building and creating new networks and connections and personal interactions. So I really hope that this is going to continue because I have seen this as very something very, very positive and fruitful as well. I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here now if the situation wouldn't have taken place like that. And out of every crisis comes opportunity in that sense. And this is definitely a huge opportunity that we can build on and move forward with and, and create new, very valuable things out of it. So thank you. I would thanks. continue thank doing you. what I'm doing. <laughs> so thanks a lot for uh, uh, keeping yourself awake such a late. Uh, and I absolutely agree that initially the people were in denial uh, then they were uh, humbled and now they are available. Uh, so it's a, certainly a shift what we are seeing. So a lot of egos and a lot of uh, big kingdoms of the egos have shattered in the last few months and I don't know how many of them will keep on shattering as we go along. So certainly good things, certain good things have happened. 
so last comment uh, uh, from Freya. What you will do yes. if the COVID situation ends tomorrow? Yeah, uh, well, apart from, of course, meeting uh, our team, uh, working team and our uh, family members that we haven't seen for a long time now, uh, I believe so much, Professor Nikhil, in, in the, that uh, the best opportunities can be born from difficult times. And I think uh, this period of COVID-19 really gave us uh, enough time to rethink the way our lifestyles, maybe to change our lifestyles, maybe less social engagement, more effective use of time, uh, maybe to utilize and diversify, uh, maybe diversifying our businesses. Uh, my, in my case, I might think about food security businesses, health security businesses, and these type of businesses that I might think in future because of the situation that we lived. Uh, di digitalizing my business more, uh, support each other, of course, as women and uh, entrepreneurs to complete each other and to grow with each other, uh, plus uh, utilizing our international and global relationships and uh, think more and act more globally. Using the platforms that we have today to connect and to grow together and to help each and support each other. And one of the, one of the uh, initiatives that we have done in the Bahrain Entrepreneurship Organization is that we launched uh, an online platform during this pandemic, which is called BahrainSoog.bh, which is one of the tools that we tried to support our, our uh, members and Bahraini entrepreneurs and startups to go uh, beyond and globalize with their products and services. And of course, uh, we will all, uh, one of the things that I will think about is also uh, innovative uh, startups and innovative entrepreneurs who have innovative ideas. Maybe we can uh, concentrate on them more and try to get the best out of that. And uh, I wish all the best to everyone. And uh, I hope this pandemic uh, uh, finishes very soon. And thank you very much. Now, I hope so that the pandemic will end very soon, but I think the, as a human generation, we will come stronger. We will be more, uh, more connected. I absolutely agree. Uh, some of you have said that uh, uh, we were very busy uh, or, you know, when, uh, when I was uh, studying in the college, so there was a very common term which we used to uh, tease other students. Some of them were like, they were always busy. Oh, I am busy. I am busy. They are all the same. So we used to call them BWW, busy without work. So most of the people like who are traveling and like, you know, oh, I'm busy or I'm busy. So they are not available, but now they cannot escape by saying that they are busy. Of course, you may be busy in washing the dishes and cleaning your homes, uh, but certainly you have to find time. We have to work together. Uh, it's a great opportunity for the humankind uh, to find solution uh, quickly. Uh, we are humbled, we are uh, uh, something which is absolutely invisible, something which you cannot touch and feel. Uh, they have bought to our knees. Uh, there is not a single bullet has been fired and the whole world is fighting a world war. So situation is challenging. Uh, millions of people are already dying. Millions will die. Uh, that is for sure. The WHO today has said uh, the virus is here to stay. So are the humans. Uh, so it's a fight between the virus and our uh, grit that who will uh, who will uh, succeed. Most likely, it's a human who have survived the planet for thousands of years. We are the one who will succeed. Nobody can defeat us. I'm very sure about it. Uh, say, uh, so uh, we have to work together. We have to uh, come together. And such a great panel, such an honor uh, for moderating this panel today. And I was nervous in the beginning. Uh, and after hearing all the views, certainly I have to, uh, before sleeping, I have to take down all my notes so that I can, I don't forget anything. Uh, so thanks a lot, everybody, Swati, uh, Andrea, Shreyas, Bianca, Freyal for coming together and all the attendees who have joined us from all across the world. Uh, hope to see you soon. Uh, if, if everything goes fine, then most likely we will meet again. 
uh, either for a coffee or a drink in some country or definitely in Istanbul next year uh, in February. So thanks a lot once again. And sure. thanks a lot, Bhaibras, for making this happen. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.